if a little green is good, more is even better. Now, back to Green is Good with John Shigarian and Mike Brady. Welcome back to Green is Good, and we're so honored today to have Pamela J. Gordon, the founder of Technology Forecasters, Inc., and the CEO of TFI Environment. Her website is techforecasters.com, T-E-C-H-F-O-R-E-C-A-S-T-E-R-S.com, techforecasters.com. Pamela Gordon, who wrote the book Lean and Green, Profit for Your Workplace in the Environment. Welcome to Green is Good today. Thank you so much. So why don't you share with us a little bit, give us a little bit of your history in, the, in, the, in this green revolution and what you've been doing in the tech space and how you came up with the great concept of tech forecasters and your great consulting think tank. All right. Well, actually, it was almost 23 years ago that I started Technology Forecasters, Inc., wow. but it was halfway through then, so a little more than 10, 12 years ago, that I found a correlation between electronics companies that had had promoted their environmental managers to vice president, senior vice president, and that they were actually doing good in the environment and doing well for their business. Got it. So that's when I started to track the trend. Got it. Got it. And uh, so, what is your what does your company really do? Like, who are your clients, and what do you help them with? Our clients are almost all high tech companies, and all around the world, Europe, the Americas, Asia, and we help them do two things. One is to make decisions about where and how they'll manufacture their products around the world. Okay whether they're going to outsource, what kind of supply chain, logistics, that sort of thing. Okay. And the second is how to reduce their entire organization's environmental footprint and to profit from doing so. That's fascinating. We, we Mike and I were so lucky uh, months ago to have Ray Anderson on, the, on, on, on our show, and he spoke of this issue. So why don't you share a little bit about what you mean and what it means with regards to when people uh, hire you as, a, as their uh, consultant in this area. What does that mean? Explain how that works. Well, you know, the, 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 the likely way to say it is that waste is bad for business. Yes, I think anyone would agree with that, and politics aside, right. this is the way we look at a company, is their products, how they design them. We look for wasted materials, wasted processes, too much weight in the product that's costly to ship. We look at their employees' travel. We look at their supply chain, their operations at their company, we wow. look at how their executives compensate employees, and all of this together provides ideas for reducing waste at the company and saving money. And in the process, you can measure the benefit to the environment. Pamela, that makes so much sense because, uh, as John mentioned, uh, our friend Ray Anderson uh, spoke at length about waste and just how inefficient it is. So from a total efficiency standpoint, not only financially, but from an energy consumption, et cetera, the carbon footprint that a company leads, uh, you are so right on on this particular issue of waste. Well, thank you. You know, it's something that, that makes so much sense. And on all of us listening today, we're, we're thinking, yeah, that makes sense. But to actually implement that in a corporation has some challenges. Challenge one, yeah. Change is scary. <laughs> <laughs> Good, well put. Okay, yeah, we've so how always do you... done it this way, and yes, okay. <laughs> so it's r- wasteful, not so great for the environment or our profit, but it's comfortable. So that's one thing to get beyond. And how do we do that? We form a team, a multifunctional, multi-regional team at the client, and together huh. we create ways to change to reduce that waste that works within that corporate culture. Well, okay, now this is brilliant, and I want to I continue moving down that path, but I want to step back now. You said something interesting at the top of the show. You started your company 23 years ago. Pam, that was way before it was cool to be green. That was way before the, the green revolution that we're living through and living, living in right now in the United States. How was, how was the company acceptance and how was your concept received then as opposed to now? And is this one of the biggest boom times that you've ever experienced with regards to your company? Uh, great question. Well, as I say in my book, I, I started being concerned with the environment at age eight 
wow. <laughs> when my family went backpacking in the Sierra Nevada range. Wow. But it really, when I started the company in 1987, yeah. truthfully, it was more on the supply chain manufacturing strategy side. And it wasn't until about 12, maybe 13 years ago that I started bringing in the environmental, strat- environmental strategy and you're absolutely right. At first, it was, oh, well, that's interesting. Now let's talk more about manufacturing. Right, <laughs> but, right. Yes, at, with uh, thanks, I think, much to Europe. Europe has really played a key role, a beacon in raising to the forefront environmental reg- uh, legislation right. in the high-tech industry. So now people have paid attention. Right, right, right. right. So so that's, you bring up Europe. So that's a great point. Uh, you know, You've you yeah you have clients from around the world correct yes correct? okay so now look at the three major uh, pieces of land in this world Europe North America and Asia explain where all of those continents are as a as, and, and 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 in terms of the green revolution who is the most evolved who's moving the fastest towards it and who's uh, and who's lagging but catching up okay well you know I first have to tip my hat yep. to the USA because back in the 70s, sure. when uh, President Nixon was in power, he started the Environmental Protection Agency. Oh. And that was an end-of-pipe approach to capping pollution just before it reaches the atmosphere. And at the time, that was actually a leading thought. But it was in Europe in the uh, 80s and 90s where they started saying, you know, if we look at the way we design our products from the beginning, right. that's the most effective effective way. The German version of the EPA said 80% of a product's environmental impact is decided at design. Ah. And then Japan said, well, we don't want to be behind Europe. So they moved ahead. So it's been an, an, a, a, a race where one region advances in front of the other, and that's great. Let's continue that because that's good old capitalism, and it creates good products. So is this now that now you're 23 years in this, have you become an overnight success now, all of a sudden, just now, because the green revolution has really taken hold here in America? Well, I, certainly not an overnight success, <laughs> I know, but, but I would teasing. say that uh, you know, I'm certainly enjoying my job more than I have in years, and it feels very satisfying to help these companies do something right. Just on Saturday, I joined one of our high-tech clients on a trail cleanup in Silicon Valley. And you had people from all over the organization in their jeans and work shirts and gloves and bright orange vests working together about the environment. And that's just one small symbol, but it means so much to a career and to what you're doing for a living. But and when I meant overnight success, I mean 23 years you've toiled and you've done this great work, but now all of a sudden you're being seen as one of the green leaders of this whole green revolution. So truly now people you know, don't understand all the toiling that you've done and all the great work you've left in your wake, but now, now, now this is the cool thing. You're the cool person. You've got the cool job. Well, thank you, but we need a lot of cool people. This is so not a, a one-person job. Um, it can't be just Ray Anderson and me. Right. It has to be all of us. So uh, I, I told a friend a little while ago that I'm starting to get a little bit more maniacal about the environment, and she said all of us need to be because <laughs> this right. is a, a global concern. And in business, certainly, you can get so much bang for the buck by simply creating structure around waste reduction. It's so fascinating. You know, I'm gonna, Mike and I, a couple of weeks ago, we had the wonderful people from HP on, and they talked about their boxes now are 100% rec- made out of recycled materials, and the and their new, their new printers were made out of 50% recycled plastic. So you're so spot on on that whole design issue. But let's now move on in terms of the scary, getting over that word scary. How do you get both the buy-in from the employees on the scary, but more importantly, how do you get these CEOs to sign off on these environmental initiatives that you come up with. Well, that's key. And, and when the CEO is behind an environmental strategy corporate-wide, sure. it's like pushing the boulder downhill. <laughs> and without the CEO's endorsement, it's like pushing it uphill. So the way we do it is we create a business-driven roadmap. Okay. A roadmap in a format that every CEO is accustomed to seeing where you've got quarter-by-quarter plans, you've got expenses, you've got return on investment. The only line that he or she won't be familiar with is a CO2 impact or water or trees impact as well. But it's very business-minded, very serious. And the good news is the more you reduce the waste, 
the more money you save, uh. the more markets that can open to you, the more competitive advantage that's available. So these roadmaps have, as a bottom line, multiple millions of dollars of savings. Right. And so far, every CEO has signed it. Wow. So what are, what, what are some of the big mistakes or pitfalls that uh, you know, a company or a CEO or chief sustainability officer can make when trying to execute their corporate or environmental sustainability program? Well, I would say that you know, one is all good intentions, but baby steps is a mm. problem. Right. And if you have a team go on its own and say, yeah, let's re- replace our styrofoam cups with paper ones or you know, let's see if we can trim 10% off our corporate travel. These are all fine, but I call them baby steps. It is hard, as we talked about earlier in the conversation, to get people to change. Uh. So we have a concept called leapfrog, huh. where you change five steps all at once, because that <laughs> time it's just one change to introduce, socialize, get approved, and execute, instead of five smaller ones. Right, right, right. So, so, so you have the leapfrog, and then what is that? How does that evolve? Explain how that that evolution at the company evolves, and how much time does it take to set in the new uh, green DNA that you propose to the CEO and to the employees? Well, one of the things that really helps is benchmarking. Huh. If the CEO and the employees, managers aren't accustomed to some of these more advanced green strategies right. and expose them to perhaps what others in their industry are doing or if their industry is lagging, then others in, in similar industries around the world or regions and show them these impressive large steps forward. And it inspires them and frankly, it fires up that competitive spirit. Right. Now, are, are, are the uh, electronic companies that you consult to and the tech companies, are they now sort of in their own space race and that you're consulting with them and they're, are they all trying to be greener than the other now? Well, absolutely. I mean, now that a lot of the tech, tech companies are making their CO2 reduction plans public, right. they're reporting to the Carbon Disclosure Project <laughs> and such. They're all seeing each other's carbon reduction goals. Oh, 25%. Oh, 30%. 50%. (laughs) I can do better. Absolute reductions. No relative reductions. So I think that that does fire the flames of the competitive spirit to reduce impact. Oh, gotcha. So, what? I mean, talk about some of your, um, some of the paradigm of a company that you started working with, and whether you give the name or not, it's irrelevant, but like how much money can a a company save when they start implementing your, your, your goals and, and, and what can that mean? What can the domino effect then mean to that company? Well, let's pick a, a mid-sized electronics company. Okay. Companies that are, uh, they have products out in the marketplace, but they have an outsourcing strategy. So they themselves are not doing the manufacturing, but they're ah. having the manufacturing done by an outside company. Okay. And if for a mid-sized company, we, we actually have several clients in this range, and okay. it seems like $7 million is the the lucky number, oh. uh, coincidentally. It, so, you know, you can expect to find 5 to $10 million of savings by just reducing waste across every product line, across your operations, travel, logistics, et cetera. Do you have to physically f- go to their production facilities and forensically audit them, or do you have people that do that for you and report back to you, then you read the reports and you know how to crunch numbers? How does your system work if I'm hiring you or if one of my listeners out there are listening to what the, you're talking about and what your great company, uh, techforecasters.com, does? I mean, what is, uh, you know, how do we go about hiring you and what do you actually do for me? Well, let me say that the absolute expert... The top expert is the employee who's doing the work. So it's that employee on the manufacturing line or in the packaging, seeing all this wasted material, or the employee who's being asked to travel back and forth to Chicago every month when there's really no good business reason for it. It's the employee in China who sees a whole new idea for designing the product to make Mm. it lighter weight and fewer materials, or in Europe saying, why do we have to travel to this sales conference in the United States every year? Right. Uh, so it's, it's create, what we do as a team, we create a team within the company uh. and give them benchmarking, inspiration, guidance, strategy, language of the CEO to get them to come up with all of the ideas for savings 
We even do a contest that involves everyone at the company because you never know where the next big idea will come from. Fascinating, but that, now tech companies can be, you know, you're up in the San Francisco area, the Bay Area. Tech companies can be funded by all those wonderful venture capital companies. The founders can be there, but the design team could be in Europe. The marketing team could be in New York, and the building of these materials can be in China, Malaysia, India, or somewhere else in the world. How do you pull that all together? Ah, that's why the green team has to be multi-regional in ah. addition to multifunctional. Gotcha. So we have representation from Europe, from Asia, from the Americas. We had a Design for Environment webinar last week. Someone from Brazil was on the line. Wow. So it, it definitely includes all of the regions. And what's so exciting about it is that someone in one non-headquarters region will come up with an idea that headquarters loves and implements in a much broader way. Pam, do you, is there incentives? You know, we, we've had wonderful companies like the CEO of Recycle Bank on our, sh- on our show and, you know, talk about incentivizing to create behavioral change. When you create the green team within, uh, intrapreneurially within a company, is there incentives that are given then to the green team to hit benchmarks and to get everybody going on this path? I think that's important. Now, culturally, it depends where in the world you are. Okay. In Europe, quite often, people are most incented by having an opportunity to get some publicity for what the idea they've come up with. There's one company that did give monetary awards to the best green teams within their organization, and you know what these teams did? They turned around immediately and donated that money to an environmental cause. In, wow. the, in, in the United States, just because culturally some people are a little bit more of it motivated by cash prizes or a wonderful gift or, or a bonus in their salary. But I think that if we look at it systemically all around the world, I would recommend that CEOs include as part of their variable compensation packages environmental achievement because it reduces costs and benefits the bottom line. So you create environmental achievement uh, rewards inside a company? Yes, based on some uh, well-defined goals, either in carbon reduction, cost reduction, putting new, greener products on the market by a certain deadline. There's all kinds of ways to very seriously and very tightly measure your successes in green. That is fascinating. So why don't you share, uh, Mike and I, as in our lead-in, Mike and I were talking a little bit about um, Apple and all the how they push technology to the next level. And and we know that a lot of we've had we've had Panasonic on the show, and they've talked about, like you said, designing designing for the future, designing to be more recyclable, designing also out of recyclable products. Give us a little window. Give our listeners a little window on what's coming, because I know you're doing a, a conference in, a, in another month or so uh, t- talking about design and this is what you do. So share with us, give us a little window or visibility on the future of technology. Absolutely. Well, you know, you can think of it as a, as a checklist. You can think of it as how designers can make choices between materials, looking at the toxins of the materials or maybe recycled materials, as you mentioned earlier, regarding HP. We can have them look at the energy efficiency of the product. Or if it's not an energy-using product, then certainly there's energy in manufacturing the product almost no matter what it is. And we can train them in looking at the weight of it and how that impacts the travel, logistics, shipping, storage. So it's a checklist, if you will, of all of these factors combined into what are the best ways today to design products given that the environmental shortages are real. Gotcha. And are you, do you feel hopeful where we sit today in 2010 that products are being designed better and more ev- environmentally responsible? No. Okay. <laughs> in a word. Okay. I, in general, I'm an optimist in life, yeah. but I do feel that in this area we're just not moving fast enough. Okay. That's and fair. that's why I enjoy my job so much, because we get to show corporations the benefit, the business benefit of designing their products in a greener light, and they do it because not only because it's right, but because it benefits their business. And that's the way I believe that we're going to catch up in design for environment and in a few years have truly exemplary products and have DFE be the norm. 
you know, Pam, we're down to the last two minutes, unfortunately. But, you know, a lot of our listeners are, are, are young people who are excited to become part of the Green Revolution. And they look up to people like you. So they want to know how they can become the next Pam Gordon. What's some words of wisdom for the next generation that want to get on board? What, what, what can you share with them to get them inspired to become part of this revolution? Infuse your vision who you are as a person, and what you value in this world into your career. Okay. And stop nothing short of that. That's and brilliant. make demands on the corporations who hire you to be the best corporate citizens they can be because it's not only right for you and for the company and the world, but it's good for their business. Oh, that's wonderful. That is just that is just wonderful. Well, 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 well. Pam Gordon, Mike, and I are just honored to have you on today, and we we, we wish you all the most success in your continued great work at Tech for- Forecasters. And for our listeners out there that want to hire Pam or want to go see the more of the, the great work she's doing, go to her great website, TechForecasters.com, or read her book, Lean and Green: Profit for Your Workplace and the Environment. Pamela J. Gordon, you are inspirational to my. Mike and I and all our listeners, and you are truly living proof that green is good. Thank you, John. Thank you, Mike.